and thank you for joining us for another episode of Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Pentucket Medical Cardiology, as well as Haverhill Community and Television. My name is Dr. Sonny Srivastava, and I'm here with my associate, Dr. Seth Bilazarian. Today we're going to talk about a, um, a new and exciting field or topic called pharmacogenomics, which to explain that a little further is um, a discussion about how our genetics influence or, or dictate how we respond to different medications. Uh, and it's becoming increasingly important because we are learning and seeing more and more that patients and people respond differently to medications. And there's a lot of reasons why that uh, occurs, and we're going to talk about that. And um, maybe I'll start off the discussion by talking a little bit about how we presently prescribe medications to individuals. Um, it's sort of a one-size-fits-all approach, which um, clearly has its flaws. Um, for example, with cholesterol, uh, we often will just pick a medicine and start at a low dose, and it's the same dose, for example, 20 milligrams of simvastatin, and we do that for everybody. And then we increase it as, um, as we see fit, but uh, perhaps there are ways we can better decide which medicine to pick or what dose to pick, um, and that's what leads us into this field of pharmacogenomics. Uh, and, and so with that being said, I will um, hand it over to Dr. Bill Azarian for a moment, and uh, he'll lead us down the, the path about this. Great. Well, so I think whenever we start talking about the whole topic of genetics, a lot of people get very frightened. You know, it very, sounds very complex. But I think everybody knows about the basic concept of genetics, that we get uh, instructions on how our body runs from our mom and our dad. And uh, we get different levels of instructions sometimes. I think people know some children look more like their mom, some look more like their dad. And that's the same sort of thing that has to do with genetics and other aspects, how our body handles certain medications. So for instance, <clears throat> as you said very well, we currently just start with the same dose for everybody, but some people respond a lot to that medicine and some people don't respond at all. Some people have side effects from the medicine. So it can hope, we're hoping that by figuring out what, what ways people respond, we'll be better able to guide treatment. Not only how we start the medicine, but whether a patient's expected to have a side effect, maybe not use the drug at all if they're going to have a side effect, and also maybe use a lower dose if someone's going to have a very good response. So there's a variety of hope that's, that comes about. So this idea of pharmacogenomics is really just an understanding of how genetics plays into our, uh, our body's handling of certain medications. So that's really what we're talking about today. And I would say that uh, just to, to emphasize that that's very, that can be very complex, even for, I think, people like us as physicians who went to medical school and have been trained, the language of genetics is, is really very different than the language of um, clinical medicine. Uh, I sometimes have to even catch myself because I, I don't deal in the language of genetics, uh, but we're, we're increasingly being exposed to it in clinical medicine. So it's something that, that it's fun to, to think about. And I'll just make one general comment for the audience that there's a concept uh, that's used, a term that's used commonly in genetics. It's called wild type. <laughs> and in polite society, it's not good to be a wild type, but all wild type means for the genetics is that that's the normal genes. So if someone has the wild type gene, it doesn't mean that they're crazy, it means that they have the normal type of gene, whereas someone might have a different uh, kind of gene that's been changed from a mutation or they've inherited something, so they wouldn't be wild type. So that's really one of the, an example of how this can be very complex. So as you said, our current uh, approach is to uh, use this, but uh, use just a sort of standard uh, um, um, one-size-fits-all approach. And uh, we do have the advantage in some kinds of medications that we can change the medication to achieve a desired effect. And use the example of cholesterol, but of course there's others like blood pressure. We have blood thinning medicines like Coumadin or Warfarin in which we can adjust the medicine. But there are a variety of issues that come about from this that are suboptimal. So the hope is, is that there are certain groups of medications that might really uh, um, lend themselves to this approach of pharmacogenomics where we would, before starting the medicine, test the patient, do a simple blood test, get an answer about where they fit in, and then based on where they fit in, decide about which medicine to use, which dose to start with, and what, what kind of pitfalls we might, we might come across. This has not been fully adopted yet. It's, there is early adoption of it by some uh, medicines 
in what's called a package insert with certain medications, we now have labels that say, be careful if the person has this kind of genetic abnormality. And that's for the medicine Coumadin or Warfarin, and it's also for the commonly used medicine Plavix. So you and I, as practicing clinicians, are sort of in a, in a tough spot because on one hand, the FDA has put it in the packaging, but they haven't told us exactly how to use it, who we should get this kind of uh, testing done in. Right. And are these tests readily available if you go to any lab or anything can... Well, it's a good point. They are mm. readily available, but it's one of the pitfalls of this, that they're readily available, but they may be very expensive and also may not be covered by certain kinds of insurances. And the insurance issue is a very complex one. It's very interesting. For instance, with regard to the genetic testing for this medicine, Coumadin or Warfarin, some insurances don't cover it at all because it's not really at the standard of care. But we have one insurance company I know you know about, uh, the, the insurance company that um, uses the uh, pharmacy benefits plan called Medco. Some of our patients get their medicines from Medco. Medco has actually called us and faxed us and say, your patient's on warfarin, you should do the genetic testing. It's kind of interesting because it doesn't make any sense to me as a clinician to do it in those patients because they're already on the warfarin, we're already using it, and we already know if the patient's doing well with it or not. It does make a lot of sense to me to use it before we start with patients. So that's an example. So for to use pharmacogenomics, it said that, that it would make sense to use it if it was um, very valuable to, to, to use it for a drug that we needed to be very closely monitored and really need to get to them on the drug fast. And that's again an example of that medicine, Coumadin. When someone has a blood clot in their leg or in their lungs, we want to get them on the, the drug very fast so that their drug level is good, so their blood levels are thinned then that would be an example of a, a medicine that would be. But something like blood pressure, where we want to get someone's blood pressure in a good control, but we don't have to do it right away. We could take several weeks or several months to achieve a good level. That probably would not lend itself as much to this kind of testing. It, of course, would be very valuable to prove that doing this testing really does benefit patients, lowers the chance of side effects and other kinds of issues. Um, there are some drugs that have been shown that aren't necessarily in the cardiology realm, but there's a, a seizure medicine called teg Tegretol or Carbamazepine, and there's a gout medicine called Allopurinol, and both of those have been shown that if there are certain kinds of genetic uh, um, markers that can really mark patients who are at really high risk for very serious side effects from those drugs. So that's an example of those drugs. Maybe we should be doing this kind of testing. The other thing is that it could be very helpful for us <coughs> just to help explain why it's happening. Why someone, <coughs> excuse me, why someone doesn't get a good response to a particular drug could be from this, but it may not be. Sometimes we know very well that patients don't take their medicines, and that's a common reason why. But if a patient had this as a marker, it would help understand why they're not getting the kind of response that we hoped for. Uh, there's a variety of, of other things, but um, there's some complexity around this, but we'll talk about that in a second. But I would just say that um, one thing that's, that I think is really in the, out in the um, newspapers and really written about a lot on the Internet and on TV is that it's now been about 11 years since the entire human DNA sequence was, was sequenced. So that was in 2000, and I remember very well that people were very excited. Uh, there was a reception on the White House lawn, uh, excited about how this was going to really change medicine. We we're going to see dramatic changes. In the last 11 years, we haven't seen really, there's been a lot of research in this area, but we haven't really seen it come down to the clinical level where we can do genetic testing and actually really make an impact. So I think that this is now really the beginning now after 11 years that we're really going to have the building blocks of being able to use this genetic testing to really go forward to make an impact in patient care. And what do we... Uh... I mean, maybe you're going to get to this more talking about some of the cost-effective issues with this or the practicalities of it, for example, with, with high blood pressure. Does it make sense from a practicality standpoint or a cost standpoint to check every patient who has high blood pressure to see how they're going to respond to certain medicines? Because it's a ton of people. Um, I think that that's a good question, and I think that your example is a good one that wouldn't be lend itself probably right. to pharmacogenomics. There are some other strategies that are markers that we might use, but not genetic markers per se. Maybe down the road genetic markers will play a role. But I think, as you said, because we, don't, we aren't as much of in a rush to get patients' blood pressure under control, right. a trial and error approach might be reasonable. Even if a, even a patient of medicine, they don't get an optimal result. The blood pressure stays not yet into the good range, but stays above the good range. We could then just try add additional medicine. So that's an example of where pharmacogenomics might lend itself to be helpful, but it's probably unlikely to be helpful from a cost standpoint. But uh, there are some, and there's uh, several pharmacogenomic tests that are available. And the, and the three that I, I would mention 
in our realm as cardiologists are the coumadinal warfarin, plavix, and statins. And just to example, go right, right off the way, I'll go right to the issue about the uh, Coumadin issue that you described. Uh, Coumadin is really a very complex medication. We've talked about that on prior shows. We've talked about how strategies are available to, to monitor, monitor Coumadin. We now have some testing you can do at home called home INR testing. But the Coumadin situation is very complex. I think most patients who take Coumadin know that the way it works is it poisons our ability to make clotting uh, protein. So our body needs to make these proteins to clot, and the way the Coumadin works is it makes it difficult for our body to make those, those uh, clotting factors. And those uh, clotting factors are vitamin K type clotting factors. And it's been shown that you could actually test for the kind of genetic disposition that patients have, that if this vitamin K uh, target that the Coumadin goes to has one of three different kinds of changes or mutations, that those differences can make a big impact on how Coumadin is handled. And so I'll just cite some examples. Um, more than 2 million people are started on warfarin each year in the United States. About 20% of them are hospitalized in the first six months after starting the Coumadin because they are bleeding from too much Coumadin. How high was that number? It's, it, the number that was quoted is 20%. Wow. So if we could identify patients, that would be a dramatic difference. So 20% of 2 million, we're talking about a lot of patients, uh, that's 400,000 people. If we could cut that in half, that would be a dramatic cost savings benefit for the system, as an example. Um, there has been a lot of testing that's shown that pharmacogenomics has been shown to allow more patients to safely benefit by it. And uh, it actually was shown to cut hospitalization rates by 30% by using this pharmacogenomic strategy. It, wasn't, it didn't show that anything was improved in terms of how much patients were kept in the good range, but it did reduce this hospitalization. So that as a first study was very encouraging. So more studies are ongoing. That's an example. But just to summarize briefly, warfarin has all of these different changes. Uh, there's a variety of different um, of these different uh, changes in these what's called genotypes that might be important markers. Um, one one uh, uh, study looked at 12 different studies, pulled them together. It's called a meta-analysis. And this, these 12 studies were pulled together, and they showed that these changes accounted for 12% of the changes that happen in patients' Coumadin levels. So um, that's really important, I would say. Uh, these changes um, seem to happen f uh, with a greater frequency in uh, white Americans than in, in uh, Americans of other races, 6% of patients have these changes uh, that are, are uh, white Americans and 1% African Americans and 3% Asians. So there are some racial differences, uh, but that's, that's an example of something that, that might be a way to market. There are two different uh, of, uh, allele types. These alleles mark patients' differences in how Coumadin is handled. And uh, in both of these types, they're more common in white Americans than in non-white Americans. So does this, do these genetic variations explain why I have a patient who it takes just one milligram per day of Coumadin to achieve a therapeutic level, whereas I have somebody else, same size, same weight, it takes 15 milligrams per day. Is that what's causing the problem, that the way their, their genes are laid out? Well, there's two things. So I would say probably to answer your question. There's the way that the body takes in warfarin and handles it. So if the body gets rid of warfarin very quickly, of course, it's not around to do its job. But it's also the way the warfarin interacts with vitamin K. So there's two things. Mm -hmm. And there's actually now been developed a chart, which is you and I have of accessibility to it. It's actually on the internet. And this chart asks you to look at the two different genetic markers. And if you have the one genetic marker that's the way the vitamin K is handled, that's on the top of this chart, and on the left side is the way the body handles Coumadin. And it actually tells you what the dose of Coumadin should be. So we have that as an available, and then there's actually a website that's now available that you can just go to. Uh, it's called warfarindosing.org. So you and I, or patients, can go to this website called www.warfarindosing.org. And if you have this genetic information, you can enter the patient's race and size and a variety of other parameters and come up with a, a, an expected dose that would be a good one to start. So we're moving away from giving everybody five milligrams, which has been our approach, right. and then just dealing with some people too high, some people too low, to try to be more rational in our approach. And I think that warfarin is an excellent example. So that's the real issue that, that's very exciting that, that, that a lot more information has come up. But I, again, don't think this is definitely ready for prime time. That, but it yeah. might be ready for small patients' populations, like the patient you described, that maybe is very sensitive or opposite patients who are very resistant. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, 
the major barrier still is the ability for a patient to get this test done easily, uh, cost or insurance coverage, right. so that when I see someone in the office and they're going to start warfarin, you can't wait weeks to get this done either. You want to start it and, and get going. So that's, a, a, to me, a big barrier. What else is a barrier right now to getting this to be more prime time? Well, I think the bigger barrier, other than, you know, you and I who are talking about this, I think that many physicians aren't, have, you know, haven't yet ac become accustomed to this or heard about this yet. So that's another barrier. Um, I think a lot of this is going to be changing in the coming year. In September of 2011, uh, we are expecting the results of a, na a large study being sponsored by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And that is a study of this evaluation method. 1,200 patients are going to get this testing and then be starting on Coumadin to see if it's definitely a way to go. And if that's the case, one would expect that payers and others would say, well, now we have good evidence that this is a good way to go. And it may ultimately, as I said, be cost savings. Although the, the test might cost $100 or $200 to do the test, if we can prevent hospitalizations for bleeding, we may be cost savings in addition, of course, to do better care. Sure. But of course, you know very well, one of the other things that's happening in this field of blood thinning, I'll let you handle this one, is other changes that are happening. Well, yeah, I assume you're talking about this new medication that is an alternative for patients with atrial fibrillation, which is a, a condition we often use blood thinner, that's Pradaxa. And I think we've talked about this in other shows, but uh, also a new and very exciting development um, that can really change the way we treat patients with atrial fibrillation. Right, so uh, on the one hand, as you said very well, that we have this old drug that has a lot of burdens and we might find out a better way to use it going right. forward, but we have a new drug that doesn't seem to have these burdens, which might be yeah. a, a better way to go. So it's a very interesting sort of yeah, option. it's nice to have options. Right. So it's every, right. every patient's different, different uh, needs, so options are good. I agree. Um, so moving on, we talked about warfarin or Coumadin, it's also known as, and I wonder if we can move on to another drug that I think my last check is the most prescribed drug in the world, uh -huh. uh, Plavix, yes. or also known as clopidogrel. Yes. Um, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what that medicine is, what it's used for, and what the state is with regards to genetic testing. Sure. That. So this medicine, uh, as you said, Plavix or clopidogrel, is prescribed to 40 million people around the world. That's four times the number of people that live in Massachusetts, <laughs> to put that in perspective. And uh, <clears throat> this drug is most commonly used after someone has either a heart attack or a stent as a cause for them to get this medicine. Now, <clears throat> this medicine, when you take that pill, Plavix, and put it in your stomach, that medicine doesn't work. It works by being absorbed into the bloodstream and then converted to the actual the blood thinning medicine. So Plavix is called a pro-drug, and that's just a term that's used for the drug before the real drug. So this drug, Plavix, has to be converted. And that's not uncommon. There's a lot of medicines like that. That's Correct. right, yeah. exactly okay. right. Yeah. So uh, the question then is that what has been discovered now after we use this drug for a long time is that some people, it doesn't work, this drug. It doesn't really thin the blood the way we want. And some number of people who it doesn't thin the blood in end up having another heart attack or have other problems. So a variety of testing has, been, has come about, and what's been discovered is, is that some people don't convert it from the pro-drug to the active drug. So they take that pill, they take it every day faithfully, no other problem, but it doesn't actively become the blood thinning medicine that protects them from another heart attack. So maybe, you know, for, there's different types of tests you can you do to check Plavix efficacy, I guess, if you will. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what those tests are, and is that different from the genetic testing that's emerging? And right. Well, there's two ways to think about it, and I think that we don't know what the right way to go. Um, we have actually talked on this show in the past about testing that you can do to test whether Plavix is thinning the blood. At this point, we don't know whether that's the right way to go, because there's been some things that say that maybe that's not the best way to go. Right. This testing just tests whether you are the kind of person that's going to make it the active drug. And just to quote some general figures, 24% of white non-Hispanic population, 18% of Mexicans, 33% of African Americans, and 50% of Asians have this problem of not converting it to the active medication. Remember when I talked about Coumadin, it seemed like more white Americans had the problem with the genetic abnormalities. Here, it's the non-white Americans or non-white population has a problem with this drug in terms of, of making it work. And what's been shown in, in several trials is that if you are one of those people that doesn't convert it to the active uh, form, you're much more likely to have a problem with another stroke or heart attack or other kind of issues. What kind of percentages are we talking um, about? Well, so in a one-year study, um, they showed that 21% of patients who had the variant had a problem, and if you didn't have the variant, you, you metabolized Plavix properly, you had a rate of 10%, so a, a doubling of the risk. 
It's a lot. So 11% more people over the several years of this study, actually, oh, sorry, one year of this study, had a problem. So that's, that's a tremendously high yeah. thing. So if we could identify those people, we have an excellent option. We could actually change them to another medicine that doesn't have this problem, that doesn't have this prodrug, a newer form of Plavix. So it's very interesting how this will play out. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts or musings about this, but well, next where, year... Where, this where are we as far as the ability to check these tests? Uh, again, that's an issue yeah. of expense. So right. in terms of we can check them, uh, but the cost is uh, several hundred dollars at this point for the genetic testing. And usually out of your own po the patient's pocket. Yes, it will yeah. be a challenge to get this testing from most insurers. So at this point, it's not a matter of routine where we can just check it off like a cholesterol and get this test. And now what, what does the FDA, what, not the FDA, but, uh, well, yeah, the FDA, what does the package insert say it's, from the FDA? It says exactly like I, what I said with the genetic testing for both Plavix and the Coumadin have it. So when you get the drug from the pharmacy, there's a thing inside the package insert, and it will say, if you have this genetic abnormality, you might be at risk because you're not going to get the benefit from Plavix. But how do you know that without the testing? Right. So as it's a, a catch-22. As a clinician, that's frustrating. Here it is, the FDA putting this huge warning in the prescription for everybody who gets it. Right. But when it comes to daily practical practice of medicine, you can't do much with it yet. Right. And, and I know that you know yeah. the issue here is yeah. that, that the FDA doesn't deal at all with money. We have another agency at the government called, the, called CMS right. that decides. So they are often out of sync. So FDA yeah. will say, this is good, and CMS may take a longer time to decide to pay for it. So that's right. an often an issue that we're dealing with. Right. Now, that's a frustrating thing, certainly, as a clinician. Um, so that's so things still to be determined on that front. Right, uh, right, right. Certainly, exactly. Um, but exciting nonetheless. But I guess a practical um, issue that I think that you know you and I know is that you know as trying to be responsible citizens with regard to healthcare costs and trying to be responsible to our patients. One thing that I anticipate will happen that in 2012, Plavix will become generic. So it will go from a very expensive drug, $150 per month, likely very. So over the next six months or so, it will come down very quickly. I assume into the 30 to 40 dollar range per month. So we'll have that versus the newer form of Plavix, which will stay at $150. So there'll be even greater incentive to use Plavix, but we'd love to use it appropriately to be able to say, look, everybody needs Plavix except this group of patients. And they are worth spending the extra money on for sure. the other medicine. That would be wonderful. That would be ideal. We'll have to see if that comes out. Yeah, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of change coming down the road, certainly. It certainly is. Um, so another medication you mentioned earlier that uh, also... Uh, um, it attributes itself to pharmacogenomics or statins or, chole or you know, cholesterol medications. Uh, so let's maybe dive into that a little bit. What's the state of affairs with that? Well, there's two things that, hap that, are, ha that have been identified about statins, and you and I know this, and it's really very interesting. If you give a group of people, you know, take 100 people, and you give them all a medicine, let's use the example you used earlier, simvastatin 20 milligrams, the average lowering of their cholesterol is about 35%. But some people have a 60% cholesterol lowering, and some people have a 5% cholesterol lowering. So there's this big range. And, you know, we always just sort of just shrug our shoulders. Well, you know, you don't respond as well, or you respond a lot. Just crank it up. Yeah, so, just, yeah. so the people who don't respond as well, we, we crank it up. The people who respond um, more, we say, this is great. You don't need much more. Maybe you can even get by with less. But there's, we now are able to identify with this testing possibly uh, maybe becomes part of standard of care, a test that identifies who's the best responders. Also, there's now a test to help us identify who is likely to get the one really difficult side effect from statins is muscle aches. It happens in a lot, it happens severely in a small number of patients, but it does happen. And there's actually a genetic test that can identify who is really gonna suffer from this. So it'd be nice to know, and, and maybe 10 years from now, you and I will have a battery of tests that'll say, look, I'm not even going to give you this medicine because it's going to cause you real troubles, or, uh, or I'm going to give you this medicine, and I know it's not going to cause trouble, it's going to be really excellent for you because it's going to really lower cholesterols very well. So at this point, I think that the, why I want to bring pharmacogenomics to our audience and have a discussion with you about it is that there are several medicines. We've covered cardiology medicines. There's a really a lot of information about uh, antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressant group. There's some uh, uh, evidence for certain kinds of cancer drugs, like a drug called tamoxifen used for breast cancer, that pharmacogenomics has powerful benefits in, in helping identify who will benefit and who won't. Uh, I focused as cardiologists on these three drugs that, that we use a lot in our practice, and I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about this, and I think I would anticipate that in the coming years, uh, sometime in the middle of this decade, we'll be expecting to see this as a standard of care. It'll be a standard battery of tests that we use in all patients. Great. Well, that'd be very exciting. 
Um, any other issues we need to address? We're starting to run a little bit short on time. Um, other issues you want to address before we wrap things up? Yeah, I guess I would say that the key points that I want to share is that these these things are called polymorphisms. They mean just the changes in our DNA or, or genetics. They are, do affect the way our body handles drugs. It's sort of a common sense kind of thing. I have patients who tell me, you know, I always have trouble with drugs or I don't have trouble with drugs. I've had trouble with that kind of drug. So, so we know that there are differences. We know people have different color eyes. People have different color hair. It makes sense that people have different ways that they handle different drugs. Testing for certain kinds of these drugs before prescribing might really give us great benefits in terms of how to prescribe it, whether to prescribe it, which drugs to avoid, and how, what, what dose to start on, rather than use a one-size-fits-all method, which is what we currently do. Pharmacogenomic testing has only recently begun, so we don't have a lot of information, but at least like it's coming really quickly now. So I expect that you'll hear about this from your patients or on news information in the coming years. And uh, many of these drug tests are available, but for the time being, as Dr. Sunny has pointed out, we don't yet have uh, uh, coverage for them, so it's not become a routine use. So I think those are the major highlight points that I want to bring up for this session on pharmacogenomics. Great. Well, thank you. It's a certainly an exciting time, um, and look forward to see what's happening in the next uh, five to ten years. Uh, so with that, I'll start to wrap it up. Um, I had Dr. Seth Bilizarian from Pentucket Medical here with me today. My name is Dr. Sonny Srivastava, and this was Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Pentucket Medical Cardiology, as well as Haverhill Community Television. Thanks for joining us.